Hey there everybody, it's Mike Delisio, and today I'm going to be taking a look at Whale Riders, coming to you from designer Rainer Knizia and publisher Grail Games. In Whale Riders, you are playing, as you might expect, whale riders traveling down an icy coast, buying goods that you're going to then sell to fulfill contracts, trying to gain the most victory points in the process. Let's head over to the table, I'll show you how the game is set up and played, then we'll come back here and I'll give you my final thoughts. Okay, here we see the setup for a two-player game of Whale Riders, and in Whale Riders you are playing as the titular Whale Riders, who are traveling down this icy coast, purchasing goods that you're then going to use to fulfill contracts. We start at the Sun Port, we travel down to the Lobster Port, at which point you turn around and you go back up to the Sun Port. The game is going to end when the players have bought all of these pearls at the sun port. They cannot be purchased at the beginning of the game. You have to travel down and back. Once every one of those pearl tiles are purchased, the game ends. In this game, pearls are victory points, and you're trying to obviously get the most victory points to win the game. Each player is going to start with three coins and three contracts in hand. All right, so it's a very simple game. Mechanically, what you're going to be doing is taking two actions on your turn. They're going to be from a list of five different things you can do, and you can take the same action twice if you like. The first action you can do is advance your Whale Rider one space. So if I'm the purple player, I might take my first action to move to this next port. I could theoretically take my first two actions and move down two spaces. However, once you move down, I could not go backwards to, do, to get something there. The only way I'm going to get back up here is by going all the way down to the lobster port, turn around, and come back. So, first action, move your whale rider. The next thing you can do is purchase a tile. And all of the tiles have a printed cost beneath them, and it's the same all the way across. The first tile is free. It doesn't cost you anything. Then one, two, and three coins. So, perhaps for my first two actions, I move one space, and I take this double meat tile into my tableau, and then what would happen is, after you've taken both of your actions, you slide the tiles down and you refill them in this, from this lovely screen printed bag. And now you've got four tiles on display again. As the game goes on, you're going to be also getting these snowstorm tiles. And basically what these do is they are going to, let's say that I had, instead of drawing this, I had drawn this tile. Now as tiles begin to get purchased, these are going to move down and clog up spots later up later on in the game. So you're going to have a number of ports that have these snowstorm tiles there that are taking up the cheap cost spots in the tile. So the other thing you can do is just simply take a coin. Very simple. Take one coin. The other thing you can do is you can discard any number of contracts that you have from one to three because you're always going to have a hand limit of three unless you have a special power, which I'll talk about later. You're going to uh, discard as many of those as you want and then draw back. The last thing you can do is fulfill contracts, and that's how you're going to be getting the majority of both your money and your points. So, as I said, you've got a hand of three cards, contract cards, in hand. You will see that they require different goods, and they're going to give you a number of points when you fulfill them, which are the pearls, and immediately a number of coins. So, in this case, three of these herbs, if I spent those, I would be able to get uh, two points at the end of the game and two coins right away. The one thing to keep in mind is that if, for example, I had, well, that's not a great example. You can, you, you might end up overpaying, all right? So this is seven meat. If I had these tiles in my hand, which add up to eight, I might spend those to fulfill this card. I don't get any change for that. So. Uh, you're, you're kind of stuck with what you have, and you may end up overpaying a little bit. Also, there are different types of contracts. You've seen this type, which is simply turn in a number of a particular type of goods, get a number of points, get some coins. There are also contracts like this, which are simply 
three of any type of tile. Doesn't matter what's on them, doesn't matter how many uh, of the goods are on them, just three tiles of any type will get you some points and coins. And this one is numbers of goods total. So 10 total goods you turn in. Again, it doesn't matter what kind, uh, and you get five points in this case and four coins. All right, so fulfilling contracts is gonna be primarily how you're gaining your points. You also see these tiles that have pearls on them. These are just straight victory points, okay? So you can purchase these just like a regular tile, and they're gonna give you points at the end of the game. And so what's gonna happen is players are gonna continue to move down the coasts, purchasing items, fulfilling contracts, getting down to the lobster port, choosing when they want to turn around and come back. And once you get back to the sun port, then you're purchasing these pearl tiles here, which are always going to be in this orientation. The first four single pearl tiles, then two double pearl tiles, and finally a triple pearl tile. These go for one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven coins, respectively. At the end of the game, what you're going to do is you're going to count up the number of points that you've gained through your fulfilled contract cards, through any pearl tiles that you've collected throughout the game. And if there is a tie, there are some tiebreakers there. The tiebreaker is, uh, first of all, uh, the player that has the most money left over. And if there's still a tie, it's the ones with the most tiles left over. That's the base game. Pretty simple. Now, there are two variants that you can add into the game if you want to maybe increase the uh, difficulty a little bit, but it's just a very little bit. The first one is called the Clan's Decree, and basically this is just racing for goal tiles, and you would randomly select four of these and you put them above the board, and they're, again, races for uh, any number of things. Or for In this case, if you have eight tiles, you turn that in, the first one to do it gets two coins, and then that goes away. Okay, if you have fulfilled three contracts, the first person to fulfill three contracts would claim that for three points. Um, the first person to reach lobster point get two points, etc. So there are diff different ways, very simple, four of these shuffled up randomly and placed above the board. Your first one to get them is going to be able to get the bonus, whatever it is. Then you've got the magic of the whales, which are some special power tiles, okay? And these basically are drafted in reverse player order. And you're, you're going to lay them out in a line. This is during setup, after you've determined who the starting player and player order is. You lay them out in a line, and you can choose from the first three in the line, okay? Again, in reverse player order. And they all give you a particular ability, power that you have throughout the game. So, for example, this particular one, when you're buying tiles, normally you can only buy one tile for one action here. For the buy one tile action, you can buy as many as you want, as many as you can afford, all right? This changes your hand limit from three contract cards to six contract cards. So when you, re when you replenish, you always replenish up to six, and you also get this at the beginning of the game. So you're gonna have six contract cards instead of three at the beginning of the game. In this case, all of the single good items count as wilds, and I should have mentioned that. You might notice these crystals here. These are wild. They count as, in this case, one of any good. There are also some double wild tiles as well. All right. This ability allows you for an action to swap the position of any two tiles at the port that you are at. This action will allow you, instead of taking one coin as an action, you can take two coins as an action. This, this excuse me, uh, power is the first time that you move your whale rider on your turn, it doesn't count as an action. So you can move for free. This tile is when you're performing the buy one tile action, if it's a single good, only has one of whatever it's depicting, it doesn't cost you anything no matter where it is in the port. So for example, if I had this power and I was at this port, I could purchase this for free because it's only a single good. And then finally, when fulfilling contracts, you can do one less of any good. So uh, if you needed, you can maybe use this to, to spend one less shell or one less meat, that type of a thing. So those are all special powers that you can also add in. They are known as the magic of the whales. All right, that's the basic overview of the game. Why don't we head back over and I'll give you my thoughts on the game. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a pretty good idea on how Whale Riders plays. It's a relatively simple game mechanically, but is there any depth hidden in there in that design? Well. Let's, uh, let's dig a little deeper, shall we? First thing I want to do is actually talk about art and components. And 
The first thing I have to mention is this gorgeous, amazing, beautiful, pick your, uh, <laughs> your uh, superlative there, uh, artwork from Vincent Dutrait. This has been a teaming that has been uh, for a few games here, this team of Reiner Knizzi as the designer, Vincent Dutrait as the artist, and Grail Games as the publisher, uh, Medici. There are, there are a number of them in this line, and boy, this is just gorgeous, gorgeous art. I mean, it, it is just bright and colorful and welcoming, and anybody who sees this on the table, I think, is going to find the actual aesthetic of the game just gorgeous. Um, very, very well done as far as the art goes. The components are also very good. The board is nice. It is not oversized. I know that that may sound a little bit odd, but it seems like in the last uh, I don't know, few years, I'm noticing a number of boards that are almost superfluous, that, that it's like they're there, and yes, they do serve some kind of user interface purpose, I suppose, but they're maybe larger than they need to be and, and maybe take up more table space than they need. The board in Whale Riders is just right. It gives you a place to put out your tiles, but it's not taking up too much of your table space. Um, it's good quality cardboard. The cards are very good quality with lovely art on them, very easy to read. Uh, so uh, a really good job all across the board there. Now, I actually got a Kickstarter version of this game that came with wooden colored whale meeples that you could use instead of the standees that I showed you in the overview. I honestly prefer the standees because A, it has more of that gorgeous art, but I think it actually functionally works better. Those little meeples can kind of get knocked over, especially when you've got larger player counts. Now, that is something that I will mention regardless, whether it is standees or whether it's the wooden meeples, if you've got a higher player count, it can be a little bit cumbersome kind of getting all of those to fit. So you could have had a larger board, but I don't know that that would have actually been a trade-off I would have taken. So uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, as, a, as a point of reference. So for the overall game experience, this, I feel, has kind of that classic Kinesia formula of simple rules but engaging gameplay. I'm telling you, there's something so refreshing about being able to teach a game so easily. Being able to say, there are five things that you can do on your turn. They're all very easy to understand. Here's what they are. And people get it. People understand it right away because it's not bogged down in a lot of edge cases and things along those lines. It is a family weight game. Make no mistake about it. But even within that, it is a breeze to teach and it leads to a, a very smooth gameplay. This is probably best at lower player counts because the chaotic and variable nature of the market of tiles that are in each port can lead to a situation where if there's a very particular tile that you feel like you want or need, in a larger player count, it very likely will not be there when it's your turn. So you, you have to either be aware of that and be okay with the fact that there's going to be a lot of variability in the market the larger the player counts, or you just stick to this as a, as a smaller player count game. It plays fantastically at two. Uh, I enjoyed it in the larger player counts to uh, up to four. I did not play this as a five or six player game, although it does play up to that. I don't know that I would ever really want to play it at a five or a six player count. I think I would top out at four. Although it is nice to have the option, there are not a lot of games that uh, have as wide of a player count. I do think this probably works best at a smaller count. There's a really strong element of player-driven pacing and tempo in this game. And to me, that really is the hook for this game. Because, as I've mentioned, it's very simple. There's, there's a bit of, you know, almost set collection where you're trying to gather particular types of goods that you can then turn in for these uh, fulfilling contracts. Not a lot of variability there, but where the hook comes is in the tempo and the pacing. Because you really feel this tension as a player if people are starting to push forward. Because once you start moving down towards that lobster port, obviously you can't go backwards. And there's a temptation to kind of stay at a port and snatch up the lower value, the lower cost, not lower value, value necessarily, but lower cost tiles. While other people are moving ahead and maybe having to pay more for the tiles they want, you can kind of wait for the tiles to come through. 
but there's also this feeling of tension when people are moving along and it's like, I, I'm getting left behind here. How long can I stay in this port? When do I need to start moving to catch up? And I really like that kind of tension that the game has, this underlying tension of, okay, do I push the tempo? Do I push things forward? Do I hang back a little bit and try to let other people push things and kind of clear out the tiles that I don't want? And if a good one comes in, I can jump in and grab one. So I really like that, that sense of tempo and pacing. To me, that's the, my favorite element of the game. There's a also very tight economy I have found that I feel adds some, dra some dramatic kind of feel to the game as well. Um, you can have a situation where maybe you uh, have set yourself up well and you can turn in a couple of uh, contracts, fulfill some contracts that give you a fair amount of money. But really, after you get that starting three coins, the only way you're getting money is by fulfilling contracts. And so, yes, at every port, at least at the beginning of the game, you can get at least one tile for free. Now, as those uh, snowstorm tiles come out, that may not be the case, but the, the economy is pretty tight. And so you have to be very careful about how you're spending your money. You know, you may see a double wild crystal tile in the three cost spot or a two uh, pearl tile in that three cost spot. And that's always this great tension of, boy, it's expensive. It's a great tile, but it's really expensive. And so I like that tight economy. I think it works very well in this game. There's also a very unique end game kind of scenario that this game presents that I like a lot, where you've got at the beginning of the game that market of pearls, those points, and it's the same setup every game no matter what. You can't purchase them at the beginning. You have to make that full route from the sun port to the lobster port and back to the sun port. And again, it's that, that whole sense of pacing. How quickly do I try to get back? Do I try to get back first? Do I try to let somebody else go in there and maybe buy some of the cheaper tiles so that the, the two and three uh, pearl tiles get to a cheaper point uh, so that I can come in and, and kind of snipe them from them? Or will someone go in there first and just go ahead and pay the seven bucks to get the three uh, pearl tile? Is that worth it to them? It just It's going to depend, obviously, on where they're at and what the game state is. But I really like that kind of interesting end game scenario where you are essentially trading coins for points. Um, now that's been done before, but in this particular manner, I can't think of another game that does it quite like this. So I quite, I quite like that. I will say this, those uh, optional modules that I showed you in the overview, I would say always play with those modules. I, I feel like they are so simple to add, so little rules overhead, but they really make a huge difference in the game experience. Uh, th those special powers are great. They all feel really good. And, and you know, you're, every one of them sounds like it's one you want. And I love when, when uh, games give you those kind of powers that are very easy to understand, but they all sound great. It's like, oh yeah, I want that one. Oh, but I want that one. Yours is better. No, maybe mine's better. I don't know, but they're all great. Super simple to add. The goals are the same way. Very easy. You know, always put them in there. I kind of wish that they had made the base game rules, including those elements. And then if they wanted to say, hey, here's a family variant where you can remove one or both of those modules. It, it's not a huge deal. And I understand that this is a family weight game and they're maybe going for more of a welcoming game. But even with both of those modules in, it is still very much a lightweight, welcoming, family weight game. So it would have been nice, I think, if that had been part of the main core rules. Now, the thing that I love so much, this tempo and pacing, can lead to some frustration for, for players. I, I've been in games where some players felt out of sync, like they just weren't in sync with what they needed, what they wanted, what they were drawing. There is a fair amount of randomness involved because you're, you know, blind drawing uh, contract cards and you don't know what tiles are going to be coming out of the bag. You do need to be able to pivot, but... You, you, you have to be aware that you can kind of feel like you're a little bit out of sync, especially at higher player counts, and that can lead to from some frustration, so I thought I would mention that as well. Also, the fact that there is such a simple slate of actions that you can take can lead to a little bit of a feeling of kind of rinse and repeat. Well, it's like, I know what I'm going to do on this turn. I'm just going to stay here at this port and buy a couple of tiles, or I'm going to move one spot and buy a tile. You're not there's not a lot of dynamism to the, to the actions you're taking. And so I guess maybe the trade-off to how simple it is to teach and learn and play, the trade-off to that is that 
you can have some turns where you kind of feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again. But again, I think what really kind of sets this apart is that tempo and pacing. So overall, I quite enjoyed uh, Whale Riders. There's no doubt that the art and the components add to that enjoyment and the table presence is lovely. And the fact that it's so easy to teach and learn and it plays so quickly is a big bonus for it as well. You can have some issues where you're feeling a little bit out of sync and there is some randomness. So uh, depending on your play style and the types of games that you like, you should take that into account. For me, I'm giving it a 7.5 out of 10, a clear seal of approval. I feel like this is a game that has wide appeal and uh, if it sounds interesting to you, you should definitely check it out. That is Whale Riders. Well, that's it for me. This is Mike Delicio signing off from Dice Tower Headquarters.